Um, let me introduce the three of them. We're going to ask, uh, it's, our, it's our format in Take 5 programming to allow them each to address the audience uh, for five or more minutes. Uh, we're we're going to let them go on a little further. Sometimes we have more than three. So we'll let them go on a little longer than usual. Um, and then we will open it up to you for questions. So be thinking of what your questions might be. Our first speaker tonight will be Kenneth Hardvickson, who is the curator of the exhibition, and he received his PhD from Boston, and MA from Boston University, where he specialized in American art and visual culture. With research including American painting, popular illustration, and print media, and the visual cultures of popular music, he has delivered papers and published articles on topics as diverse as sheet music illustration, the flag in American art, and the visual aesthetics of popular music performance. He's taught art history at Boston University, Weber State University, Westminster College, and BYU. Since 2016, he has been the curator of American art, which in this country, which in America, is a huge position. I mean, it's, you, you go, you, you meet the curator of our American art from, from museums anywhere, and they, they, are, they are the elite. And, uh, and Kenneth is, is rubbing shoulders with that group now. Uh, Westminster College and BYU. Since 2016, he has been the, uh, oh, I read that already, um, where he's curated exhibitions featuring contemporary, contemporary American artists. Most recently, Kenneth is the curator of M.C. Escher Other Words, Worlds. And it's not like that he's an American artist, but Kenneth, uh, I have found, can bring uh, a tremendous insight and originality of thinking to any uh, body of art. Gary, Professor Gary Barton received his MFA from The Ohio State University, where he's the recipient of the of University Fellowship, and where I had the privilege of being his uh, co-graduate uh, student. We currently, he currently serves as the chair of the Department of Art and primarily teaches printmaking and advanced studio courses. He served as the director, co-director of numerous study abroad programs, collaborative projects between BYU and various national and international institutions, and other experimental learning programs for students. In his art, which is great, he works predominantly on, he didn't write that little insertion, uh, he, he works predominantly on two, uh, two dimensional media, including painting, printmaking, and mixed media. And I've got to tell you that Kenneth gives a great tour of, of uh, MC Escher, but uh, to walk through it with Gary Barton's printmaking eyes was, was extraordinary. Uh, he works, uh, his work has been exhibited widely nationally and internationally at venues including the Contemporary Art Space in Chester, England, Minnesota Center for Book Arts, Utah Museum of Contemporary Art, Spectrum Project Space in Perth, Australia, PR1 Gallery in Preston, England, Cityscape Gallery in Vancouver, British Columbia, and Studio 61 in Florence, Italy. Steve Ricks, uh, was described by BBC Magazine, Music Magazine, as the composer, quote, unafraid to tackle big themes. His work often includes strong narrative influences and theatrical flair, as does his, just his performance in life. <laughs> his music is performed and recorded by several leading artists and ensembles, including the Manhattan String Quartet, New York New, York New Music en Ensemble, Tuohan um, Percussion, uh, New York, Hexnut, Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands, Lynx Ensemble, Paris, Earplay, San Francisco, and uh, Empyrean Ensemble, San Francisco, the uh, violin Curtis McComber, New York. His commissions include Fromm Music Foundation Commission and several Barlow Endowment Commissions, including a 2017 Barlow Commission for New York-based musicians Dam Lippel Guitar and the ensemble Counter Induction. His third portrait CD, Young American Inventions, was released by the New Focus, New For, Fo, New Focus Recordings in June 2015 and has been described by Seattle-based blog Second Inversion as, quote, innovative, ambitious, and diverse. He holds degrees in music, in music composition from Brigham Young University, the University of Illinois, at Urbana-Champaign uh, Ur 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 and at the University of Utah. He also received a certificate in advanced musical studies uh, from King's College London in 2000. He's a professor of music, uh, he's a professor in the BYU School of Music where he teaches music theory, composition, and directs electronic music studio. We welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming each of our panelists tonight. <laughs> Thank you.
for a lot of good reasons, it probably makes sense to start with Kenneth in this panel. So we'll, hit, we'll invite him to speak first. show you a little bit about Escher's life 
and how he evolves into the artist that you all know. Now these are some of the earliest pieces in our exhibition. Um, he, he made these in 1922. They're, part, they're illustrations for a text that a friend of his wrote that's kind of a semi-humorous, semi-philosophical poem called Flor de Pascua, or the Flower of Easter. Um, and so he's illustrating other people's ideas at this point. He's working in woodcuts, which uh, Professor Barton will tell us more about woodcut in a few minutes, so that helps me out. I don't have to try to explain it to you. Um, but he's, he's carving these into wood and then creating a print. He is a printmaker, so most of the images you have in the exhibition are prints. And you can see that even in this early phase when he is illustrating someone else's ideas, he's still creating images that have little seeds of the things that he will continue to develop as a mature artist. Notice, for example, the self-portrait in the sphere on the right side. He loves doing self-portraits in curved mirrors, and you'll see multiples of those in the exhibition. That's something he would turn to again and again. On the left side, we have this winding, labyrinth, maze-like space with this lone figure on this kind of ominous staircase. This doesn't look like the mature Escher, but you can see he's already thinking about things that will continue to intrigue him. Staircases, mazes, uncertain perspectives. So even in this early phase of his career, he's thinking through some of these ideas. Uh, in 1922, he moves to Italy. So he's actually from the Netherlands, but he moves to Italy. In Italy, he meets a young woman from Switzerland, Jetta Huneker. They fall in love, they get married. They live in Italy for 13 years, and people will tell you, the biographers will tell you, this is the happiest period of his life. This is where their first two children are born. Uh, this is a woodcut he made of Yetta. He loved her and talked about how beautiful her slender hands were. He actually wrote a poem about her hands. That's how much he was in love with her in those early days, which makes it even more sad when we know where they ended up later in their lives. Um, but this is when he was happiest, is in Italy. So for 13 years in Italy, he's really honing his craft. He's not, he, you know, in, this, in these um, Italian images that, I sh that I'm showing you here, he's not working to appease uh, somebody else's ideas. He's not illustrating someone else's ideas. These are just things that he's creating as if out of spontaneous joy for this country that he comes to love so much. So we see these wonderful woodcuts, and that's actually a wood engraving of this cloister at, uh, at uh, Montreal. And look at the way he uses the light. Look at you have the sunlight actually streaming through this cloister. Look at the way that the, the shade is different within that cloistered space. Uh, that uh, on the one side, there's just a teeny bit more light within that covered shaded area than there's on the other space. Look at the detail in the columns. I know it's hard to see. The columns in the background have a, a zigzag pattern on them. And then the columns uh, in the foreground have these kind of curls on them. And then the other columns to the side have this kind of twisted checkerboard. So all these little details, and the original carriage is only like this big. So he's giving all of this detail. He's really stretching his skills. But he's creating in this Italian period, as I said, just out of a love for this landscape that inspires him. Here we have now this the white, that the white. Block around the end. Uh, Professor Barson will talk to us about some of the print media. So he's trying different print media, woodblocks, and lithographs at this stage. He's producing landscapes. He's showing images of buildings that inspire him. And this really marks this very happy period of his life. But this doesn't last forever. In 1935, the Eschers have to leave Italy. 1920s and 1930s, students of history know is the rise of the fascist party in Italy. And fascism, among other things, tends to be ultra-nationalistic. So the fact that she's from Switzerland and he's from Netherlands means they're never really going to be Italian within this new fascist framework. Eventually, they start making their son wear a uniform to school, and that's when the Eschers decide they need to leave. So they go to Switzerland first, and then they end up in the Netherlands. But the thing that's so interesting is that when you look at his artwork, he leaves Italy in 1935. You look at the artwork on either side of that leave, of that leaving of Italy, you will see a stark change in his artistic process and style. When he leaves Italy behind, he also leaves behind representing scenes that he experienced in real life. It's as though he is saying, that was where I was happy, that was where the world made sense. And like I said at the front, he said, I want to testify that we live in a beautiful, orderly world. Well, how do you create images of a beautiful, beautiful and orderly world when you had to leave the country you love because of the rise of fascism? You can't do it by showing us things you've seen in real life. You have to do it through imaginary, abstract spaces. And as you leave Italy, you leave behind real-world, observation-based printmaking, even though clearly these prints are still filled with his observations that he has made throughout his life. Now, one of the major creations on this phase it's on the way to Switzerland, they go to Spain, and they go to the Alhambra, this Moorish fortress, and they see this beautiful tile work. And he and his wife are so interested in this tile work, they spend several days sketching it. And then he figures out a way to take this, what we call tessellations, which are these interlocking geometric tiles, and to use them in representational transitional imagery. So we have this sky uh, and water, where the negative space around the fish is moved upward, becomes the shape of the birds. So using
using those tessellations to do something that you would not see in the Alhambra, where it's pure geometry and not representational. Um, so that's sort of the first stage of his mature career, right? Working through these tessellated forms, finding a new way of expressing himself that doesn't rely on real world observation of things that he experienced firsthand. Then eventually he becomes interested in ideas like infinity. How do you represent infinity on a flat two dimensional object? Well, here he gives us this very clever, impossible shape. We have this never ending staircase to the top of this building. You can see men walking up and a couple of them walking down the staircase. Um, and they're never going to arrive at any fixed point. So this is this is this phase, this uh, later phase of his career, where he's giving us these impossible spaces. It's as though looking through and working through the tessellations gave him the freedom to not work from the real world. And so now he says, well, if I'm not going to work from the real world anymore, I'm just going to create entirely new worlds. Not only that I haven't seen, but that no one has seen because they cannot exist within our reality. Now, one thing worth noting is, as I said, even though he says, I testify that we live in a balanced, orderly place, his world was chaotic. He lived through both world wars. His mentor who taught him, uh, who taught him printmaking or encouraged him in printmaking uh, died at Auschwitz. Uh, you know, he experienced loss, and he was weighted down by the loss he experienced. In this image, he talks about this never-ending staircase being very pessimistic. He says, you know, we keep climbing these stairs, we think we're getting somewhere. I keep walk, I keep climbing, I keep working, I keep thinking I'm getting somewhere, and I never will. And it makes me feel sick. But he continued to hope for beauty, and to seek for beauty, and create images of balance and order. This is the last print that Escher ever completed in 1969, three years before he died. Snakes, and we have it in the exhibition. Look at the balance, look at the symmetry. Look at the way he creates this incredible textile of interweaving forms, as though to say, through this entire complicated long life that I have lived, here I am now as an old man, living on my own, separated from my wife, you know, facing mortality, losing my vision to some extent, losing my health, and here still I want to create an image that says to you, there is the possibility for balance and order. There is a possibility to find beauty in this life. And that's the lesson that I would like Gary? <laughs> Did you? Oh, you're going to speak there. Okay. on.
and lithographs. For example, Watercolor 21, which is, I believe, on your left, um, uh, is the little man in lithograph entitled Cycle. These are both from 1938. So you can see that relationship. So it's working through a lot of, um, a lot of ideas with sketching and drawing and, and even watercolor, and then those things. Now, relief printing is a general uh, term that describes lino cuts, wood cuts, wood engravings. Um, and that's because uh, with these processes, you take a block. Now, um, maybe a little closer. I know what I'll do. I'll hold it like this. Um, this print, entitled Puddle, of course, is in the show. And as Mark Magby and I were walking through the show, um, I mean, I think this is, this is one that I particularly like. Um, it's more complicated, printed in 1952, so he's, a, he's a, a much more experienced artist at this point. And it's also printed with multiple blocks. This one has three blocks. One's printed in black, one in green, and one in brown. And so not only for these images is he cutting blocks for, um, for the image, but he has to cut a separate block for each color and he has to align them, register them, so that when printed, all the colors work together in alignment. And this is a complicated process and takes a lot, a lot of planning. Um, here's another example. Mark, did you say you like this one a lot? Um, double, how do you pronounce it? Planetoid? 
planetoid. That's a wood engraving from 1949, and it's using four blocks uh, printed in dark blue, pale green, black, and white. These are um, really exceptional examples of relief printing, and the amount of work that goes into producing the blocks and printing is really substantial. Now, another thing that you'll see in the show are mesotints, and mesotints um, are, are laborious to produce. Escher made eight mesotints, uh, and a mesotint's created by using a tool called a rocker. I, I know there are some printmakers here, so um, you can keep me honest uh, if you hear, hear me say something wrong, but um, I've done this. Uh, you use a tool called a mesotint rocker, and I guess I, and this is a mesotint rocker right here, and it's, uh, it's got these grooves in it on one side, and then it has a, a kind of an arced uh, tip with a bevel so that each of those lines becomes a little tooth at the tip, a sharp tooth. And literally, you take a, a metal plate like this copper plate right here, which is probably what he would have worked with, and you rock the plate over and over and over again, creating an even texture of little, little burrs, thousands and thousands of little burrs across the surface of the plate until the plate prints a solid black. And then you would use tools like these. Um, this is called a scraper. This is a burnisher to reduce that texture. So you would scrape away that texture you created or burnish it away to create light value areas. This takes so much time. Uh, to rock the plate alone can drive a person insane. <laughs> Believe me, I've done small plates, and you can ask my daughter, she's here, I'm loony, so. Um, but it's, it's really pretty remarkable, the amount that goes into that. So, um, of course, this is uh, also in the show, I believe, I, a mesotint um, created in 1946, and um, another very famous piece, and incredibly executed in terms of the craft. Kenneth, Kenneth talked about, um, about Escher's attention to the craft, and there's no question that, that he is so concerned about that. Uh, another example, Dewdrop, um, also uh, 1948, and I love these, these prints. Um, they're executed so, so well. Um, I'm going to show you uh, an example. This is some footage of Escher working and um, mainly working on, if I can get it to play, um, mainly working on uh, uh, relief and mesotint. Let's see if it's going to play. Here we go. Well, there's cheesy sound, so we're not going to listen to it. Well, maybe we will because it's going through the whole thing. This is in the show, it's about 20 feet wide. Yeah, it's that long, long one. I had this cued so we would miss some of this and now I can't get the sound that you could hear him. But you can read it because he's speaking in Dutch anyway. Or
so I made this in Keynote, and then we had to we had to export it to PowerPoint, and in PowerPoint, I lo it lost some of the um, editing here. So I'm not quite. Do you know how to make this move faster? It's not. It's not showing a bar. Oh, there. There you go. Except how do you? Is there a curse there? Oh, there we go. Well, you can just appreciate it and listen and read. In fact, I can narrate, although I wasn't a particularly brilliant pupil at drawing. I wasn't bad. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go. Well, I don't want to start over. Well, maybe we can we can figure out how to get to the end of this, and I can show you. It's nice to, it's just some footage showing him printing um, snakes, that last print he did, and, uh, and also I, I believe, um, shows him working the mesotent plate. I'm going to talk a little bit about stone lithography now. Um, stone lithography is uh, perhaps the most technical and mysterious of the major print processes. And it's based on the antipathy of water in Greece. Uh, the history of it's pretty remarkable. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's complex enough that it's extremely difficult to explain. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few highlights about the process. It requires a special kind of stone, Bavarian limestone. Uh, the stone is then grained which is a process to level, flatten, and polish the, the surface of the stone. And this is a, a levigator, a tool that's used to do that. So literally, you have a, a slab of rock. Um, it's in it, uh, you use this levigator in combination with a uh, abrasive material called carborundum. And you just, you just move it around and around and around and around until you get the, the stone flat and uh, even and give it the texture you want it to have. Um, after the stone is grained, uh, a mirror image of the final print is drawn on the stone with a black grease pencil. So uh, I should note for you that uh, in addition to all the complexity of the process and his images with printmaking, you always have to create the image in reverse Right, the mirror image on the printing element or the plate or stone, because when it's printed, it reverses. So all of that has to be taken in, into consideration when planning the print. Um, it, the image is drawn with a grease pencil, and then it's processed um, with a fairly involved chemical uh, process. The image is, is kind of, this is, really a, a term I'm using to help you understand it, but fixed to the stone. Um, and as a result of that process, um, if, it's, if it's done right, the image areas will be oleophilic or loving grease, and the non-image areas will be hydrophilic or loving water. And then what you do is um, you apply water to the whole stone, and then you take a roller with grease-based, oil-based ink, and you run it over the stone. And the areas that love the grease hold the ink, and the areas that love the water hold the water and repel the oil-based ink. And then once the stone is inked up properly, paper is put down, it's run through a press with pressure, and the ink is transferred from the stone to the plate, and it allows you to print multiple times. So one of the things that's interesting about printmaking is that it allows you to print multiples. And many of the prints that you'll see in the show are additions. You'll see down um, in, in usually in a corner of the print an addition number. And the, it's, it's like a fraction. The numerator represents the, the pr specific print. The denominator represents the, the entire addition size. Addition is just a series of identical prints. 
And so think about that too, why Escher might have selected printmaking as a, as a medium of choice um, when, you, when you understand that you, print, you can print multiples of an image. Um, Escher did the drawings on his stones, but hired professional lithographers to actually print them. Um, he did the printing for his relief and mezzotints, and that's why I wish we could get that video to play without having to go through all eight minutes of it. But um, it shows him printing, and, and he, he enjoyed that process. Lithography was, um, well, I won't, um, I'll let you kind of try to, to uh, understand why he might have had somebody else print for him, but it is a, a fairly complex process. Um, Escher created his first lithograph in 1920, but it really wasn't until 1929 that, that he really began to use the process in a more significant way. And this particular print is one of the first ones he did entitled um, Plain Filling Motif with Human Figures. Okay. Um, and in this case, there would have been three different stones printed in three different colors in registration. Uh, of course, this is one of his very famous pieces, and although um, the lithographs are f far outnumbered by relief prints, some of his most famous images are lithographs, um, like this, Drawing Hands from 1948, and finally Waterfall, 1961. Um, M.C. Escher was really a remarkable printmaker. The skill... Um, for which he created images, the detail, um, the different processes uh, that he used is, is really quite remarkable. And the printing is really at a high level. Um, I think maybe in our discussion we might ask you why you think he might have selected printmaking as a medium of choice. Um, I have some ideas about it, but um, but he was very good at it. And, and the processes that he selected to use informed the work he did in, in many, many ways. Um, and so uh, I hope that as you go through the exhibition, you'll have a greater appreciation for what went into those images he created. It's really, it's really pretty stunning. Thank you. Testing. Okay, what, uh, uh, how's that? Great. Does that, does that sound pretty good? Okay. I have the unique ability to take any invitation to speak or show up anywhere uh, into an opportunity to talk about myself or my music. And so tonight's no different. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I really appreciate. Uh, the invitation and being able to work with Kenneth on uh, creating a musical composition that takes its inspiration from Escher and his work and this exhibit in particular and it's going to be premiered in February on February 23rd and so uh, I just thought I would take this opportunity to it, it'll I'll tie in some of Escher's work and the things that influenced me and I'm going to play and show just a couple of little excerpts and clips of what's what's happening so far it's the the work is still in in progress so um two of the things that uh both kenneth and um gary mentioned and touched on that uh come from escher's work that are inspire me and that i think are really interesting and have clear musical analogs are um first of all the idea of eternity and that's, that's obviously implied by the, the never-ending staircase or the other types of structures where they're kind of cyclic and, and they're really, they're impossible, but, but they sort of suggest this idea that it's sort of going on in an unreal way. So maybe some of you have heard of the musical phenomena or sonic phenomena called shepherd tones. Anybody heard of that? It's kind of like the oral e equivalent of a, a barbershop pole. So where if you, you know if you just kind of stare at the barbershop pole that it's it's in motion and it looks like it's constantly rising but 
in, in reality, it's not going anywhere. And so Arlie, uh, the, a gentleman with the last name Shepherd, who I'm forgetting his first name, but uh, anyway, he, he sort of discovered this phenomenon. But let me just play a quick example of it to you. Um, I think uh, film composer, um, let's see. So, where's the, oh yeah, it's here, okay. So let's go like that. Um, you know, I mean this, uh, so for example, film composer um, Hans Zimmer has been talking about this, I think recently in one of those masterclass lectures or whatever, but he employs it, other film composers sometimes will employ it in film music where there's like action-packed sequences, but they don't wanna stop the motion, you know what I mean? They wanna just keep things moving forward. And so here's an example, here's kind of a pure, um, just theoretic example, and hopefully I won't blast you guys out. Let's see how it goes, here we go. Okay, well, let's unmute it for crying out loud. Okay. Yeah, let's see, let's do, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's just controlled through here, let's see. Get ready, it's gonna be okay, let's see. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. Pay no attention. Oh, I'm, yeah, okay. Um, oh, okay, hold on, everyone, please, please. I'm sorry, I didn't press play. Yet. Whoa, that's loud, okay. So, <laughs> went off without a hitch. Okay, uh, check this out for a second and see if you, you under, check out this phenomenon. So. Okay, we'll just we'll let this go for about ten minutes. No, I'm just kidding. But you kind of get the picture. So that's immediately I thought of shepherd tones and just the, the idea of incorporating those in the piece. I'm I'm going to be writing a composition for piano, percussion, and electronics. And so by using the electronic realm, I could actually put actual shepherd tones into the piece somehow. You know, but I also was interested in this idea you know, just acoustically and compositionally with the actual instruments and with other materials. Um, so, and then the other thing is that uh, what Kenneth was touching on is chaos versus order. And the idea that maybe in his own life, Escher experienced a lot of chaos. We see that come through sometimes in the artwork um, or even Escher in the little film clip that, that Gary uh, presented, he's, he's sort of juxtaposing the, the order of these pure geometric shapes with the chaos of other objects or, or other phenomena, whatever. So um, thinking about those two things, let me just play uh, a little audio clip of uh, essentially what I'm imagining to be the opening of my piece, which is a very, some very chaotic audio that's taken from an improvisation I was involved with, with uh, a pianist and a percussionist, and then I was doing some electronic stuff. And I just really, I thought this passage worked well, and I could imagine it, you know, filling up this big gallery space in there. And what happens is it starts very chaotically and then works its way and ascends up towards like a single note. So this idea of evolving and morphing from chaos into order. And the other thing you'll hear right at the very beginning is my attempt at a kind of descending shepherd tone. So I kind of took a little clip that I thought was really interesting and, and then just kind of kept putting it on top of itself so that it, it was my attempt to kind of create something that feels like it's just kind of descending into the depths, but it just kind of keeps, keeps doing that for just a few seconds at the very beginning. So let me just play at least, uh, let me play this little clip for you and then I'll be almost done. And we'll be we'll be careful. Just kidding. The shepherd tones are still going. They they never stop. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Let's see. Well, that's not working. My goodness, you guys, I'm sorry. Let's see how we're doing here. 
<laughs> Never mind. Oh my gosh, you people are so helpful and <laughs> and uh, observant. No, seriously, I appreciate it. Okay. Ah, oh, and now it's deciding to doesn't like the um. Let's see how it's deciding that it doesn't like. Well, it's supposed to do that. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's see this and da 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 da. Uh -huh. Playback. Nope. Oh. Okay. Well. Um, well, I think the issue here is that I don't know if this little, it's, it's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do it in a different way. It, I'm almost, you know, just like 20 more minutes, I promise. Just, uh, <laughs> let's see here, my friends. Um, oh, it's just, I'm so close. If this was any closer, uh, we'd be hearing it. <laughs> and... <laughs> We're about to hear it. Oh my gosh. I think we're there. Okay, I'll pause it there. You can just kind of hear that descending and that crazy chaos. And then one more qu quick thing is just the intri intricacy of Escher's sketches and art and everything and the way there's all these little parts that interlock with each other and everything. So I, I started by creating some sketches of just a progression that essentially repeats uh, and it keeps going up. So kind of like the staircase. But this, this was just a little sketch I started with to just give me the notes I was going to use. It doesn't really deal with rhythm, right? And then I transformed that into a more straightforward kind of version here, which this is kind of a really lame piano sound, but let's just see what we think, see how it goes. Okay, anyway, so repetitive thing going up. And then I accidentally created one that wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be, but then I liked it. And so that's just keeps going up in these different ways. Anyway, so I took, then I took that, the first one I made and the second one I made, and then I made a, a kind of mix of them all together and chopped them up and did a little demo thing that, it sounds a little something like it take me 15 minutes or so here no i'm just kidding okay so let's see if see how this goes come on logic pro be smart there see okay <laughs> Sound is really not liking my sound, is it? Sorry about that. Jeez. I think, I think we broke it. <laughs> Let's don't listen to that anymore. Sorry. Thank you. Anyway, so uh, the yeah, I, f I find Escher's art really inspiring and. Uh, interested to take all these principles and think about what their oral, sonic, musical analogs are and build them into a composition. So thank you very much.
<laughs> okay. Show's over. All right. Very good. Uh, maybe I should wear the mic for. How are we going to do this? Uh, no, you guys keep this. Yeah. We use the uh, clip on. Okay. All right. Okay. You, oh, yeah. You can pass the mic around there. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you to our multidisciplinary um, uh, approaches and uh, from these uh, gifted scholars who are looking at Escher in three different ways. Um, appreciate each of their expertises in this. I'd like to, I'd like to ask a question about, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, I'd like to ask a question if you could each address how the patterns and or organization or the perfection of Escher related to a kind of spirituality or if it could be, if it could be spoken of as a, a shift from his childhood religion to something else or how you would see it, how you would see it as maybe even um, feeling like an acknowledgement of, you know, a beyond, of, of, of more than just mortality. So could each of you th think about your, how you, I, th I think you all recognize a certain kind of perfection and I wonder if you could, you, you could cross that into a kind of religiosity on Escher's part. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, Escher's tough. He's tough because he didn't usually like to tell people what his prints meant. Um, other people would tell him what the prints meant to them and sometimes he was okay with that, sometimes he wasn't. So he, he didn't like to talk about deeper meanings. We have a couple of examples in the show where he did say, well, this meant this to me. Usually he wouldn't do that. He just wanted the image to say what it said visually. Um, so, so I think it would be hard to find sort of evidence for that. Um, having said that, as I mentioned, he, he said we, uh, he wanted to say that we did live in a beautiful, balanced world. And I think that for him, he often saw that beauty and that order, that order on almost a microscopic level. That, you know, he, he talks sometimes to mathematicians or to scientists and crystallographers who research the way that crystals form and the kind of shapes that they make. And so it was as if he was saying that everything is orderly if only you could see it at the right level, if you could see it very, very close. Uh, but he also loved things like the stars. He was kind of an amateur um, you know, astronomer, and he would look at the stars and talk about how much those meant to him as well. So I think he, he sought that visual beauty, that order that he really uh, wanted in his life on both microscopic and macroscopic levels. Um, but as for assigning uh, you know, his own sort of spiritual experience to it, he, he would definitely have been reticent to do that. Um, however, I think that uh, for many of us, we might see that religious presence, that spiritual presence, both in the molecular level and also in the space of cosmos. Yeah, I don't know that I, yeah, I, don't know that I can add a whole lot to that, except that um, it's clear that, he's, uh, that Escher is interested in an, an other, another, an, another place, right? Um, whether it's a place of the mind or it's a, 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 an interest in another sphere, he seems to want to engage with this otherness. And there is an acknowledgement of the reality of, of the world, right? And, and he's interested in order and beauty, but he's clearly also interested in this thing that goes beyond our understanding. And I think in that way, you could, you could attach it to kind of a, a look towards a deity or another power, another place that's beyond the world. Um, the, two, the two things that came to my mind quickly were that, you know, the sense of eternity or never-ending progression. And on one level, there could be a pessimistic kind of uh, futile reading of that where, you know, you're just kind of spinning your wheels or this never any staircase, it could be, you know, like some kind of purgatory or something. But I also uh, think, think of just trying to capture eternal ideas uh, that are difficult for the human mind to grasp and that he's, he's, with the symmetry and other structures and images that he's creating, I think it, it, is, it can aspire towards that. And so that's, one of the ways, I guess, that I feel like it connects with the infinite or the eternal and the religious. Kenneth, can we read anything into him 
starting with a lot of Christian motifs and then going into kind of Islamic forms? Is that, it, is that a, a broadening of his worldview? I, I think it's certainly a broadening of his worldview. Um, you know, he encountered the Islamic uh, tile work at the Alhambra really twice in his life. Uh, first, when he was a student, um, you know, he went on several study trips throughout Europe. That's the first time he saw the tiles at the Alhambra. And so we see a little bit of that um, kind of tiling show up in his work. And then again, later in 1935, when he leaves Italy is when he encounters it again. And that's when it becomes a very powerful part um, of, of his artwork. Um, and so I think certainly being attached to his student days and then being attached to this moment when the world he thought he knew disappeared around him or where he was forced out of this world that he loved or thought he knew, uh, I think he certainly was looking for different models. Um, whether those different models, again, had, had a spiritual component to him or whether it was purely the, the visual and the geometric that inspired him. Um, but even if, if, again, even if he didn't think of it in those terms, um, I, I think it's, it's fair game for us to read that uh, mm -hmm. spiritual expansion into the work. And I think usually he would have been okay with that. Sometimes he didn't like it so much, but most of the time he was okay when people said that they found something unique and personal in his work. Questions? Yes. Thank you for a very easy to answer question. Um, <laughs> no, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the book. I'll, I'll admit I have not read it all the way through. It's, 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 a, it's a dense book. It's a, it's a complicated book to read. Um, but you know, the author, um, whose name I'm also blanking on, but he's, he's, important, uh, he's an important theorist. He's still working in the, in the field. Um, you know, he does talk about this idea of strange loops that exist um, in different places, and that these strange loops are, are self-referential. right? Um, and so you have this kind of repetition of a certain set, of a certain cycle, um, and that in his sort of theorizing of human intelligence, that's actually where consciousness arises from, is from these repetitions of form. And when you think of things like even human language, human language is really just us choosing to repeat certain sounds over and over in such a way that they achieve a certain meaning that evolves out of our usage of those sounds repeated over and over. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very complicated and, and intriguing um, question. And as for particularly the relationship between Escher and Bach, um, that's very strong. And that's something that you will see in the exhibition that I, I didn't have time to talk about. And you'll see a piano when you go into the exhibition space. Um, Escher uh, you know, said that music was his biggest inspiration. I, I mentioned at the front that he said that he, he didn't consider himself an artist. He also didn't hang out with a lot of artists. Um, he didn't align himself with other artistic groups. Um, his chief inspiration was listening to music, and his very favorite music was Johann Sebastian Bach. And he would talk about how sometimes when he couldn't figure out how to solve a problem, he couldn't figure out how to complete a certain print, he would listen to Bach. And Bach would give him the order and the, the clarity he needed to complete his prints. And so when you look at his work and you listen to the pieces of music that we've chosen to play with in the gallery, I think you can see where that connection lies in Bach's math mathematical precision, in the repetition of, of individual melodies or individual harmonic um, progressions, and how those repetitions um, taken on a large scale give you the, the, the expression of beauty that, um, that is evident in that music. And that is really what Escher was reaching for. Uh, as for the more complicated question of how it plays into intelligence, artificial or otherwise, I don't know if either of my panelists want to try to take that. <laughs> <laughs> big, big questions, big, big questions. Other questions? Yes, please. I don't know if this is, uh, thank you. I don't know if this is due to my lack of education on Escher or if this is a, a common experience, but I was surprised with how many colored pieces I saw just in this presentation tonight. And I'm wondering if there's a reason why uh, just in general as a society we're more 
prone to see his black and white pieces, or if that's just a personal experience of mine and I'm just now being uh, educated on his other pieces. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly the black and white pieces are very graphic. I was wondering, it seems like the, the science, physics, and mathematics community is really popular in this image. Like high school textbooks, I think that's the most people do. I mean, did anybody talk to like the scientists community, like why they like it? Or mathematics people? Because I mean, I've always kind of wondered. It's like they're the one. Yeah, the, um, they loved it, and they reached out to Escher. Um, so, you know, in the 1950s, uh, he started to have relationships with mathematicians. And uh, you know they contacted several, several prominent mathematicians contacted him and said, you know we've seen some of your work and uh, we love it. It's, it's we use it to demonstrate very complicated ideas to our students. And so they started licensing the work directly from him to use in their textbooks because they felt like they were you know a good way, this kind of visual way of demonstrating complicated mathematical ideas. Um, the interesting one of the interesting parts of that relationship though is not only his relationship to the art world. Um, he claims to be a math, mathematical layman. Um, he said, I don't really understand these principles that you're talking about, but if this helps you illustrate it, that's fine, fine by me. Um, now, it's a little bit hard to believe him completely, um, both because the images are so sophisticated that even if he didn't have the training of terminology, he surely had the, the logical framework of understanding that he was understanding those principles on a deep level, even if maybe he couldn't teach a class on mathematics. And the other issue is that he did continue to have these relationships with mathematicians, and sometimes, you know, he would ask them for help on solving certain images, and sometimes, you know, they would send him textbooks and he would try to read them and understand what he could learn. So there was more relationship with the mathematical community um, than sometimes he would let on, and, and he would, kind of like he did with the art world, sometimes set himself apart a little bit, but he would, Sometimes lecture with, at science laboratories. I mean, that it was a, it was an active part of his career. I was just going to add to that 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 artists sometimes come to solutions of problems in very different ways than others, and uh, mathematicians might come to to a conclusion in using a certain method, and an artist might come to that same conclusion using a different method, and and. I, I might not at all understand the mathematical method, 
but I understand a visual method of coming to that solution. And I suspect that's, that might be where he's coming from, as he's saying, I don't understand, I mean, I can have a conversation really with these mathematicians and understand all these formulas, but I can, I can address those issues uh, in a different way. Phil. Question for Steve. Uh, you talk about easier writing uh, based on Thank you, Phil, for uh, asking. <laughs> that, that didn't seem planned at all. No, that was, I'll pay you later. Uh, February 23rd, I believe, is the, tar is the date. It's a Friday evening, so we'll kind of, you know, uh, be part of the ongoing museum's Friday night activities. And uh, it's, yeah, it's meant to be, one, one of the things that I'm also chewing off of in the Escher's stairs is the fact that here in the museum there's lots of stairs. And so I'm, I'm planning to have three different setups for the performers, so they'll be set up in the main gallery, but they'll also have a smaller setup in the balcony and another setup in the basement area. And so over the course of the performance, the piece will have multiple movements and the players will physically be moving to these different setups, uh, maybe in some kind of, you know, very abstract way, kind of simulating the kind of motion you see in some of these, these etchings. But uh, anyway, yeah, so February 23rd, mark it down. Great admission. Very good. One more question. was not ethnically Jewish. Um, yeah, this particular uh, mentor, um, Damis Gita, uh, was his last name. And uh, he was one of his mentors and teachers uh, in relief printing. And if you look at some of Damis Gita's work and Escher's early work, you see a clear influence. Um, and they remained friends. Uh, and he, he was sent to Auschwitz and died in the concentration camps. Now, um, Escher um, is even though you know, I mentioned the, the sort of fascist situation in Italy, Escher was largely apolitical. He didn't talk a lot about politics. Um, he certainly didn't read political messages into his prints or intend them, at least not on the surface. Um, and that's, that's true uh, you know, kind of throughout his life. Um, but I, even though he didn't talk about it or didn't seem to align himself politically, there's no question that the, the difficulties of you know, political destruction and, and cultural destruction uh, in the world wars had a lasting effect on him. Uh, and I think that particular loss of the mentor shows you how. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, one more round for our panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>